Thanks for joining us on Power Lines. This is Bloomberg Quint. I'm Harsha Subramaniam. Good afternoon. I'm Ira Dugal. Let's get you the headlines. Indian markets extend losses trading near the day's low on weak global queues, mid-cap index under pressure. Indigo stock takes a nosedive after its earnings missed analyst estimates by a wide margin. Jet Airways and SpiceJet also head lower. HCC stock posts the sharpest intraday fall in more than nine years after its subsidiary Lavasa fails to honour a debt payment. Vedanta and Adani posts are the two other Nifty companies that will report their numbers today. All right, all those stories coming up, but first let's do a check on the markets. Yatin Mota here with the market check. Afternoon, Yatin. Yeah. Uh, so if you look at the markets, uh, clearly at the day's low, and you know, uh, if you look at stock-specific action, that is much deeper in terms of the cuts, especially the stocks uh, in the FNO segment. Uh, the mid-cap end of the market is taking a beating, especially after the SEBI circular, which asks for more margins to be shelled out uh, for FNO trades. Uh, now, if you look at uh, you know stocks like uh, HCL Tech, UPL, Kotak Bank, all of these stocks are. Uh, top losers on the Nifty. In fact, uh, we had HCL Tech down as much as 8% on an intraday basis, recovered from the day's low, uh, but still, uh, you know, weak in trade. Uh, Kotak, after the phenomenal run post the earnings, has seen some bit of profit taking at higher levels. So, you know, the stock, uh, despite being at record highs, uh, you know, has seen some uh, volume and price action in trade today. Of course, uh, aviation stocks in focus, both uh, Jet Airways and Indigo are down almost, uh, you know, 10-12% last time I checked. Uh, and clearly, after uh, the market leader Indigo indicated that there have been cost pressures because of riding, rising crude oil, and in general, uh, the pricing in the market is weak, uh, we had other aviation stocks also follow suit and are down in trade. Apart from that, uh, we have uh, the likes of PC Jewelers, Reliance Communications, HCC, uh, JP Associates, all of these heavy debt companies are down in trade. And of course, we had Fortis also, which is in focus. Uh, stock is uh, marginally down, but we had a big block deal in trade. And uh, you know that is uh, the reason why the stock is looking at some uh, volatility in the last uh, half an hour of trade. Yatan, thank you for so much for that. That's the markets for you. Uh, Let's move on. The market regulator has issued a circular for additional risk management measures in the derivative segment. SEBI has made it mandatory for brokers to collect both initial and exposure margin from their clients in FNO trading. Navneet is standing by to explain us the implications. Navneet. Thanks for that, Harsha. Well, uh, as Yatin just you know highlighted, a lot of these FNO stocks are seeing some bit of correction. That tells you there is some bit of impact that has come in post this circular, where the margin requirements to trade in the futures and options uh, segment has increased. Let me tell you what the circular exactly means. This comes into effect from June 1st. It tells from now on the trading members of the exchange will have to ask their clients to not only give initial margin, which is actually span plus the exposure margin. So far, a lot of these brokers were only taking the span margin which is calculated by a software called span and that actually covers majority of the risk while you take a position in the futures and options segment but going on they will also have to take exposure margin from their clients which typically varies between three to five percent if you look at the contract sizes why such a move has come up SEBI in the recent past has come up with various measures where they're looking to curb retail participation in the futures and options segment because if you look at the total exposure in terms of contracts in the FNO market, 50% of the, in fact, more than 50% of the position are being held under the client category. What can be the likely impact of this? It's, this means more of cost for the clients who wants to trade in the futures and options segment. The near, -term, the near term hiccup could also be in terms of volume impact. As I mentioned, more than 50% of the volume is coming from the client category. So volumes could also be getting impacted in the recent, in, in the near term. And uh, if you look at the stock prices, yesterday there was a sudden fall in a lot of these FNO stocks from the likes of Jet Airways, Justile, Indigo. Most of them saw sharp correction and similar sort of trend has been seen in today's trading session as well, which tells you maybe trading members who may not be too comfortable uh, with more exposure by their clients, they could be asking them to cover their positions before June 1st. Navneet, thanks for explaining that. Uh, let's uh, move on to stocks in focus. Interglobe Aviation has given up on its year-to-date gains today after the country's largest airline failed to meet street estimates in the fourth quarter. It also prompted brokerage houses to cut their target price on the stock. Uh, Samit Sarkar here uh, with a list of what brokerages are saying post the earnings. Samit. So if you see, most of the brokerages have cut that 12-month target price and you can see this from the, this chart here. JP Morgan has remained overweight and maintained the target price, but Credit Suisse has remained and outperformed but has cut the target price 
to 1575 from 1650 hsbc reduced it to 1475 from 1525 while other brokerages like idfc it has not only reduced the rating it has brought down the rating to neutral from outperform and has cut the target price to 1293 from 1476 in fact on an average the 12 month target price of the analyst tracked by bloomberg has reduced by around 6% to close to 1418 on the top bloomberg terminal but still suggests a potential upset of 20% but it has reduced by 6% post the earnings uh, that that came in yesterday so what has hit indigo badly this time so if you see the EBITDA margins, that is the earnings before interest, tax, depreciation and amortization and rental costs, the margin that has come in at around 19.4% in the fourth quarter of financial year 2018. Now this is the lowest ever margin reported by the company since listing. Its net profit saw a big fall. It fell by around 73% to close to 118 crore rupees. And this was the biggest fall that the company has seen on its net profit front since listing. Now three factors that led to such a weak numbers in the fourth quarter. First is the low yield. Second is the higher fuel prices and third is the foreign exchange loss reported by the company in the fourth quarter. Now yield which measures the average fare earned by the company per passenger per kilometer. Now for Indigo that came in at 3.3 rupees per kilometer. Now this is the lowest ever yield reported by the company since its listing back in 2015. Now, the yields of the company fell because of the competition in the industry. Now, company had to lower its airfares to match the competitor's prices which were offering discount to its customers because of which the yield came in at, uh, at an all-time low for Indigo. Now, if you see the fuel prices, now the fuel prices on an average were higher by around 11.5% in the fourth quarter compared to last year. Now, this from this chart, you can clearly see how the higher fuel prices have impacted the total cost of the company. Now, fuel prices as a percentage of Interglobe's revenue was at 40% in the fourth quarter of financial year 2018. This is the highest that the company has seen in at least three years and this is also four percentage points higher compared to last year where it, had, it was around 36 percent while it is eight percentage points higher compared to last quarter where also the fuel prices were higher. Now thirdly the company reported a foreign exchange loss of close to 93 crore rupees in the fourth quarter of financial year 2018 as against a foreign exchange gain of close to 160 crore rupees because of adverse rupee movement. Now, as most of the cost for an airline company are, is dollar denominated, this adverse movement in rupee has reported, has, has, and on the back of that, the company has reported a foreign exchange loss of 92.5 crore rupees in the fourth quarter and a net of impact was close to 250 crore rupees on Interglobe because of the foreign exchange change in fact. So, I mean, thank you for that. Uh, but it's not just Indigo. The other listed airlines, Jet Airways, Spicejet, have also taken a significant hit in trade today. Let's bring up that stock of both uh, Indigo, Spicejet and Jet. Jet is down about 13%. Indigo down about 14.5% the last time I checked. Uh, no, about 13%. Um, Spicejet too, down about 7%. Oil prices and competitive pricing are likely to have impacted their earnings as well. Let's figure out how much that impact has been and what's the way forward. Santosh Hiridesai, a research analyst at SBI Caps, joins us on the phone line to understand that. Santosh, thank you so much for joining in. What's going on at the aviation, in the aviation sector? Um, uh, were you surprised by what Indigo had to say? Is this an eager reaction or is there a deep-rooted problem? Well, I mean, he is uh, doing really well, right? I mean, that was on the back of some bit of moderation in the capacity uh, that has helped the entire industry shore up the yields. But the quarter four has seen a very sharp reversal in this trend, right? These are a five six percent improvement in the yield profile. That's uh, clearly down about five six percent uh, in the quarter, uh, you know, gone by. Uh, so that's come as a bit of a surprise because uh, we were looking at load factors at the system, uh, you know, and then about percent, which really uh, meant. There is a reasonable number of pricing in the system. However, uh, concrete, I guess, will uh, surprise uh, the entire industry uh, negatively, uh, which would be more of an industry phenomenon. I don't think, uh, you know, to read too much into this as a specific phenomenon for uh, Indigo. And hence, I guess, the reaction across, uh, you know, the airline stocks. Uh, Santosh, uh, uh, traffic growth has still been fairly strong, though, right? Uh, so the, should, should one see that as a silver lining? 
Well, unfortunately, I would probably see uh, you know that as a culprit. Right? I mean, while we all keep chasing volumes, right? But that's that's what is probably hurting the industry at large, right? When I look at the nine month number, the traffic was hovering in the range of 15, 17 percent growth rate, and if you <clears throat> look at the quarter four numbers, that's surged suddenly to about 24, 25 percent level, right? Now, what you uh, eventually end up doing is uh, you end up stimulating the market, which is what is giving you this growth uh, that we have seen in the quarter gone by. But unfortunately, that happens at a lot of compromise in the yields. And uh, that takes a toll on profitability, especially at a time when your uh, fuel prices have actually gone through the roof. So clearly, while you know, on the face of it, volume numbers look exciting, but uh, to me, uh, the significant growth in volumes is coming at a cost of uh, erosion in the profitability. So do you expect this, this space to be radiated? I mean, it's peculiar. On one hand, demand is growing. On the other hand, profitability is getting hit. Uh, and all these talks have been reacting. Uh, what's the way forward? So as I said, uh, I would rather want to see, uh, you know, growth rates uh, in mid-teens rather than looking at a 25% number and getting excited about it. Uh, instead, I think uh, the confidence will only come back when the yield trajectory for, for the entire system will start uh, stabilizing and start looking up because that's something which is very critical now. Uh, given the cost push, uh, clearly we need levers uh, on the yield side to ensure that we're able to pass on this cost uh, to the consumer without taking a hit on profitability. So uh, I clearly uh, see that trend uh, probably taking another two, two, three quarters before we see any reversal. So uh, clearly a summit of pressure on the uh, aviation stocks to uh, stay around. Uh, Santosh, is one place better than the other? Uh, are there some which are naturally better sort of uh, positioned to handle perhaps, you know, the fall in yields and also the continued higher oil prices? Well, I mean, uh, Falling yields is a uh, you know industry-wide phenomena, so it's not that uh, you know a carrier is uh, uh, you know very differently positioned vis-a-vis -vis peers, right? Although a different network could mean that the, uh, the quantum of the impact could differ, but directionally, I guess this pressure is going to be there system-wide. Uh, having said that, yes, uh, you know Indigo is probably better positioned for a few reasons. They have the best cost structure, which means uh, any amount of pressure or something. They are a much better place than their peers, although they could also see their spread cooling off. Uh, but given their cost advantage, uh, they will see uh, some bit of profitability that they'll be able to sustain. Secondly, I think they've got the robust balance sheet. So if the pain were to continue for a prolonged period of time, uh, you know, Indigo has got the best balance sheet to withstand any amount of pressure. Vis-a-vis -vis the peers, uh, you know, as soon as they get into red, they certainly run into liquidity problems. Uh, and finally, of course, uh, Indigo is a lot of peers probably will add up to many more uh, in the year, in the years to come, which means they have tried to hedge uh, some of the fuel costs by getting into uh, these fuel efficient aircraft. So, nonetheless, the, the yield impact is going to be uh, spread across the system. All right, Santosh, thanks so much. Appreciate you taking the time to speak to us. That's the airline story. Uh, stock's down today. Another stock that's down today is HCC. Uh, sharpest intraday fall in more than nine years, it seems. Uh, this after the company subsidiary Lavasa said it was considering a resolution plan for its outstanding debt uh, after it failed to honor uh, repayments on a bond issue. Uh, the auditor has also put out a rather scathing report on Lavasa's financials. Uh, Nikki Mirchandani joining us with the details on what's been said. Nikki. You know, the stock has actually uh, fallen as little 24%, which is the worst fall ever since 2008 after the report suggested that Lavasa might just uh, undergo bankruptcy process, which was later uh, kind of confirmed with the kind of uh, statements which were put out in the earnings uh, for the year ended March 2018. It highlighted that the company is considering a resolution plan for outstanding debt. It has to make a payment of uh, a payment of around two, uh, 220 crore as of June 2013 uh, 30 towards the outstanding debt. Also, uh, independent uh, auditors have flagged off five concerns for the company. It has said that the company net loss for the uh, complete financial year stands at 682 crore. It says that the current liabilities are right now exceeding the assets by as much as 2,389 crore and that the company has defaulted in terms of repayment of borrowing from both bank financial institution and also towards its NCDs. Uh, it has also highlighted to the fact that 
lenders of the company have invoked SDR with reference date September 2017. And all these factors combined together have a material uncertainty which cast doubt uh, in the company's ability as an ongoing concern. Uh, further to that, if you look at the financial performance of the company, revenues are down as much as 57% to a number of 27.8 crore. If you look at the net loss figure, that's almost a threefold jump there at a number of 682 as compared to nearly 167 crore that we've seen in F517. Also, the, uh, the losses have been incurred on operating level front where the company has reported EBITDA loss of a 52 crore as compared to 58 crore that we saw in the financial year F517. 2017. Separately, uh, DNA in uh, a two, uh, back in March 2018 also reported that the company is going to be considering approaching NCLT due to the challenges in fundraising for projects. Uh, in reaction to that, we saw the stock correcting as much as 13-14% back then, but then the company clearly said and denied uh, these reports as untrue. Thank you, thank you for that. Let's move on. Multiple revisions of GDP growth estimates are confusing RBI analysts. A recent paper from the Central Bank's Department of Economic and Policy Research flagged considerable volatility in government estimates. This raises the question, how credible is the economic data? Anirbha Nag of Bloomberg News joins us with some of those concerns that have been raised in the paper. What are the concerns, Anirbha? Well, Harsha, um, India's data isn't very credible. We all know that. But what's important is that the RBI has flagged it, saying that, you know, um, there are times when the revisions have missed out the upturns and then there are times when they have missed the downturns. Mm. Now since 2002 when the data they analyzed, they, they, they sh showed that um, the first estimates of GDP were revised upwards for 12 years by an average of 81 basis points. Mm. Now on the downside, when they revised it down, they, they did it only for two years, but they did it by a massive 204 basis points. Mm. Now, what this means is that, of, of course, for investors, it's like a huge amount of volatility to take. And so mm. the RBI uh, report now says that, hey, hang on, you know, you got the first estimates, which is fine. But take into consideration also the other high frequency data the others are putting out to take, get, the, get a better picture of the economy. That's what the paper comes out with. And interestingly, in the conclusion, they talk about the advanced estimates for the current year uh, and say that right after that, there were some uh, you know, other data releases which suggested a slightly different trend. Absolutely. That's, that's exactly what they were talking about, that we tend to, there's pro probably a cyclical upturn which some of the uh, central bankers are talking about, which probably we're missing out and which the first estimates missed out. In January, when they, when they came out with the first estimate, it was 6.5%. Mm. And a month later, they changed it to 6.6%. So yeah, there you go. All right, uh, policy mistakes potentially based on data which is not entirely reliable. Thanks, Anirban. Uh, that's the central bank paper that came out recently. Uh, reliable jobs data, that's the other problem, and that's a crucial uh, missing piece in India's economic jigsaw puzzle. Uh, the government has a plan to fix that defect, though the Labor Ministry plans to start publishing quarterly surveys on jobs in about a year's time. Uh, Bloomberg News, Vishri Benibal, uh, spoke to uh, Labor Ministry officials to figure out uh, the details of what that data will uh, bring to us. Vishri, I understand they have a strategy in place to record employment uh, even in the informal sector? Yes, so Ira, this is for the first time that the government is planning uh, informal jobs data quarterly survey they are doing on that and uh, at the enterprise level this is for the first time they have planned this the surveys have already started this month and they plan to publish the first report in about a year from now uh, so together with this informal quarterly report if you if you club the quarterly uh, formal sector data which they started uh, doing at the time of global financial crisis in 2008 we will be able to get a complete picture on, on the job scenario in India. The only catch is the data, the quarterly uh, data for both the formal and the informal sector will uh, will look only at, at eight sectors, which includes trade and uh, manufacturing and, and few more sectors. So, uh, so this is one data and uh, in the meanwhile, government has started publishing the uh, payroll data from uh, EPFO and uh, PFRDA and, and the insurance uh, 
data and the government is saying this this will give some some reflection of uh, employment in the sector jobs in the sector but there was a statement from statistics ministry yesterday which uh, said this should not uh, uh, there, there might be uh, some duplication in this data this cannot be ruled out so uh, once we have uh, uh, the uh, data from the payroll from from the quarterly data from the labor ministry as well as household survey data from from the uh, statistics ministry uh, analyst and economist will have some answers to their uh, jobs puzzle Rishi, thank you so much for joining us. That's the jobs data for you. Gold demand in India declined by 12% in the first quarter of the year compared to the same period last year. This is largely attributed to high prices locally. The World Gold Council said in a report, uh, Ridhima caught up with the council's managing director, Soma Sundaram, to discuss the fallen demand and the forecast for the current financial year. Here's a slice. Local price increased by 45 to 5%. as partially driven by currency. 2.5% uh, um, depreciation and partially driven by the increase in the global price. And whenever the price goes up, we have seen that immediate reaction is to wait and see whether it is real or That's it is going good. to come back. So that is also an additional reason. The GST transition, you see, if you really look at quarter one, you'll see a mixed signal. Organized players have actually done very well because they are moving faster to the transition. The unorganized segment, which is a large segment, are coping very well. They are moving in the right direction, but there are still challenges, mm -hmm. and they have also said so. So if you really look at these two segments, the organized segment has grown, and the unorganized segment is still waiting to grow. As I said, it's, again, a low base. We have to understand that. You know, quarter one traditionally is like that. So when we, as we move along uh, this year, where do you see, how would you forecast the demand in India? Where do you see it at the end of the year, let's say? Yeah. If you really look at this, in terms of trend, we have always said income drives gold demand. 1% increase in income drives 1% uh, increase in demand. And that's the, that is what we have done through our econometric analysis. Uh, <clears throat> so incomes are growing in India. And considering all the other factors, too. Yes, yes, but incomes are growing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's a growing economy. Our, our um, per capita consumption is still low, which means as people get a lot more richer, they are going to save a lot and uh, part of that saving will always flow into gold you can't you know uh, stop that and we shouldn't stop that it's a good asset to have the second thing is monsoons if you really look at what you expect now all predictions say that this is going to be a very good monsoon mm -hmm. here <clears throat> and there is already talk about uh, doubling of farmers income which Part of that would flow into this year, you know, the M higher MSPs, etc. And when rural income goes up, we have seen traditionally the demand for gold is certainly on a positive territory. So looking at all this and the last one, I would probably end with that. The price increase, again, as we have always seen, people just <clears throat> wait to see whether any price increase is, is uh, going to sustain itself or is it a short term phenomenon which will reverse back. So once that confidence comes back people will come back the other reason is uh, i mean again this is something which we have done some analysis the next two quarter uh, three quarters the number of auspicious days overall tends to match with the uh, with the 2016 uh, so okay. you will have more numbers as mm -hmm. compared with the first uh, quarter so that is again going to drive wedding purchases so, so uh, several factors it? positive actually where would you peg the growth number then at the end of the year <clears throat> Well, we continue to maintain it is going to be 700 to 800 tons this year because as we said, we have once we looked at what happened in 2016 and 17, that's when we said uh, this is, is going to reset itself and slowly inch back to 900 tons in, yes. by 2020. And therefore, we re, uh, re retain that estimate and we believe this year will be 700 to 800 tons. All right, uh, let's shift focus uh, back to earnings. Greaves Cotton has reported healthy fourth quarter numbers. Let's go over to uh, Darshan on the earnings team uh, to understand and speak to the company. Okay, so strong set of numbers coming in from Greaves Cotton. Just to take you to it, uh, revenues up 24%, profit up 21%, uh, EBITDA margins close to 14.5%, uh, EPS of uh, 2.3 versus 1.9%. Uh, last year. We are joined by the MD and CEO of the company. Uh, thank you, sir, for uh, uh, speaking to Bloomberg Quint. First of all, if you can tell us, uh, it was a strong number this time around. Which were the major products that contributed towards the revenue growth this time? Sure. Thanks, Darshan, for having me. Good afternoon uh, to all your viewers. 
as you pointed out, I think we had a plus 24% uh, quarter on quarter revenue increase and a plus 10% for the entire fiscal, right? In terms of the key highlights that contributed to the revenue growth was clearly our automotive engine business did well in the fourth quarter. Our uh, aftermarket business, uh, which uh, was led by a lot of the new initiatives in terms of the multi-brand, our part sales, our grief scare, are all kicking into next year. Also, our farm business recorded a uh, uh, significant uptick in the fourth quarter. And the genset business has been uh, did re- uh, reasonably well in the fourth quarter. So when I look at it, all the businesses started getting into the next year. And uh, we, uh, hence, the set of numbers. Nagesh, there is this uh, 13 crore exceptional gain this time around. Uh, what exactly is this? The exceptional gain was related to some surplus property that we sold. Uh, that was the, that was part of it. Okay. Uh, I was going through some reports earlier where you spoke to a couple of analysts and you had said that against the traditional business of manufacturing diesel engines uh, for both auto and non-auto component, the way ahead is that, you know, you're looking at more of a fuel agnostic uh, total solution provider. Uh, what's the status here? How is this going to pan out? Yes, yeah, so uh, that's part of our uh, strategic plan, wherein we are trying to move from being a diesel uh, engine player to a powertrain, fuel agnostic solutions and a services player. What I mean with that is we will be in the area of diesel engine going up to BS6. We will be in the area of petrol, plus CNG, plus hybrid, plus electric. So as the consumer preferences change, and the mix evolves over a period of time, Greaves Cotton is gearing up and will be fully ready and compliant to meet the future challenges. So as our customer desires changes, we will be ready. That's kind of what we mean by the powertrain fuel agnostic solutions uh, strategy. Okay, uh, multi-brand spares as well as uh, EV were the other two aspects that you say that you know are at a nascent phase, but could be the growth potential going ahead. Uh, what's the roadmap here? Yeah, so multi-brand, one of the things Greaves has is we have uh, the brand reach and capability. When you look at reach, uh, our 3,000 plus outlets across the country sell spares, not only of Greaves, but also what we call multi-brand spares, wherein any three-wheeler spares, uh, we are uh, selling across our outlets across the country. And the multi-brand business, you're right, started about 18 months ago, and then now we are seeing that get traction uh, month on month, quarter on quarter, uh, as people are coming to our dealers to look, go after not only diesel spare parts, but also petrol, CNG, and other spare parts. So that's kind of, and that business is uh, uh, kind of moving up. Okay, uh, and the final question before we let you go, uh, what's the strategy in terms of R&D spends going ahead and increasing your distribution network? How are you looking to go ahead with that? So clearly we are committed to increasing our reach even further. We have an enormous reach of uh, plus 3,000 outlets we, through the Greaves Care Network. We already have 51 Greaves Care Network across the length and breadth of the country, which is the multi-brand uh, uh, service stations, right? In addition to that, in terms of uh, uh, going forward, we'll continue to expand the dealer network and go from there. Okay. Many thanks, uh, Nagesh, for speaking to us and all the best for the quarters going ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Darshan. Have a great day. Thank you. Back to you guys. All right, Darshan. Thank you for that. That's uh, earnings. We've gotten for you. Let's move on. There's another farm of protest in Maharashtra. This time it's dairy farmers. Their complaint, low prices of milk, Purva Chitney, Susan Pune. Uh, where some of them are distributing free milk outside the district magistrate's office since sent us this report just a short while ago. Dairy farmers across Maharashtra are holding a protest starting today for the next seven days where they are going to distribute milk free of cost. Farmers are alleging that they are not getting the remunerative price fixed by the government, which is at 27 rupees per litre. Instead, the cooperative and private dairies are procuring milk from them at the rate of anywhere between 18 and 19 rupees per litre. Farmers are demanding that they get the milk at the procured price, which is at 27 rupees fixed by the government, minimum to maximum rupees 50 per litre, which is at the retail cost. The farmers are saying that for the next seven days they are going to hold protest outside the collector's office in every district of Maharashtra and if the demands are not met, they are going to hold this protest outside Mantralay on May 9th. Even if the government doesn't agree to their demands, from May 10th they are going to intensify this protest. 
All right, the downside of low inflation. Let's slip into a quick break. Uh, we'll come back with the U.S. Federal Reserve and details of their meeting overnight, but kept rates unchanged. Uh, what's the outlook for monetary policy ahead? We'll tell you that. Sorry, I'm late. क्या हुआ? कुछ नहीं यार, just working on my expansion plan. आह, funding का चक्कर. हम्म, it is so frustrating. I feel like banging my head against the wall. No no, don't bang your head. Cross the bridge instead. Bridge? हाँ, ये देख. ला. अरे. This bridge gets you in touch with interested investors. Funding happens, which means more outlets, more customers. Interesting. And what exactly is this bridge? A stock exchange created for your kind of company. Just list on it and help your business expand. Really? Yeah. So then list it. Or what? Who is talking about the work? Let's go. NSC March. Saath Hamara. Safalta Aapki. The SME Growth Platform from India's largest stock exchange. White shirts, कितने plain और simple, fox scent, plain और simple white shirt को बना दे special और fashionable, fox scent, new fashion wear for men. What if lucky discoveries could be discovered without luck? What if the secret code to investing was no longer secret? Could the complexities of business not be so complex anymore? Decode. Demystify. Learn. BQ Learning. Only on Bloomberg Quint. Welcome back. The headlines at this hour. Markets trade off days lows. The Nifty trades below 10,700 mark. India VIX surges in trade. The US Federal Reserve keeps rates unchanged, says inflation is moving close to its target without indicating any need to quicken the pace of monetary policy tightening. Cambridge Analytica is shutting down. According to the Wall Street Journal, the political consulting firm lost multiple clients in the fallout of the Facebook data scandal. All right, uh, let's dip back into the markets though and see what's moving. Uh, Agam is here with us for that. Afnoon Agam. Well, actually, the indices are not moving right now. Uh, when it comes to the benchmarks, at least they're, they're marginally trading lower, uh, at least as far as the Nifty goes. Sensex, on the other hand, marginally in the green. And when it comes to the turnovers, too, at least in the cash markets, again, uh, largely lower than the previous seven-day average. However, the FNO turnover has picked up to a certain extent in the last one hour of trade. Moving in, as far as the broader markets go, they are underperforming, the, the benchmark indices. So we're looking at a decline on uh, as much as 1% in the mid cap index and small cap index also down by as much as 8 tenths of a percent and uh, once again it is information technology and that index which is bearing down on the indices with the nifty IT taking a cut of around 1.5% in realty also showing some weakness uh, the nifty IT index is down largely on account of further weakness in HCL technologies and uh, with, uh, as well as tech Mahindra of course UPL is also contributing to the losses in the indices and uh, overall as far as the markets are concerned uh, staying quiet uh, with most of the weakness coming in information technology the US Federal Reserve kept its benchmark interest rates unchanged signaling no intention to accelerate monetary policy tightening the Fed has taken a relaxed approach towards inflation uh, that's nearing its goal Kathleen Hayes of Bloomberg News breaks down the Fed statement uh, to, the, to, to, to the future course of the Fed trajectory listen you're at a Fed meeting where there is no press conference, really almost ruling out entirely that the Fed would make a move on rates. The question becomes, what's going to happen next? What happens at the June meeting and beyond? And so these subtle changes of wording are something that Fed officials, when they write these policy statements, know everyone around the world is going to be parsing very, very carefully. And the Fed did acknowledge in its statement that inflation has moved close to 2%. So yes, it, looking at reality, telling us what's there, but not exactly beating the drum in, a, in sort of a victory dance, which suggests they're risking 
step up the pace of rate hikes. And here's why. Let's look at a, a GTV chart that is a very simple, very powerful chart to look at inflation, which the Fed is looking at too. Yellow line, 2%, that's the target. Turquoise line, the PCE deflator, the Fed's key measure, yes, it's a 2%. Core PCE deflator taking out food and energy very close behind. Uh, but in fact, uh, Bloomberg Economics pointing out that uh, the fact that the core isn't quite there yet may show that the Fed is not entirely convinced that they're, they're fully and firmly at the target. Plus, they might be wondering, is this sustainable? That chart shows you that at least once in the last year, the Fed got to 2%, and then it fell back again below 2%. So maybe they are being cautious. And here's what they said in the statement that people looked at pretty closely, because they, they've talked about a symmetric target in the past, but they added this word, symmetric, in this very important statement. Inflation on a 12-month basis, first of all, they acknowledge that it's too near 2%. They said it's expected to run near the committee's symmetric 2% objective over the medium term. Why is this important? Again, I want to come back to something Bloomberg Economics wrote today, and that is that uh, what others have said as well. This seems to be a clear statement from the Fed. Look, we're willing to let inflation run a little bit hot. Yes, it can run over 2%. Why? Because it's run below 2% for so long. Again, the door is open. Will the Fed do three hikes? Will they do four hikes? Maybe they don't yet know either, and that's why they're sending us the right signal. They're moving towards gradual hikes. No sign of a speed up here yet. Billionaire bond investor Bill Gross, our fund manager at Janice Henderson, calls the U.S. Treasury's a hibernating bear market, uh, says supply from the Federal Reserve is a crucial factor to watch. Listen in uh, to a slice of that conversation. We've also seen the Treasury announce a significant further ramp up in issuance and where on the, the yield curve ultimately that's going to set. And we've obviously for the last decade seen very little correlation between supply and yields right now. Do you see Q1 and the explosion of supply that we saw and the, the sort of rally, the ramp up in yields as an anomaly, a coincidence? Or do you think that correlation has changed as we push throughout the year? No, I, I think it should be correlated. I, I don't see it exactly in terms of what investors anticipate from the standpoint of supply. I mean, we know, for instance, that the Fed is undergoing quantitative tightening, uh, you know, perhaps taking uh, or adding 30 or 40 billion to the market for other outside investors to buy. We know that the Treasury itself, you know, is adding to uh, twos and fives and tens and thirties, probably at a billion dollars, uh, you know, an auction. Is that significant? Uh, well, it's certainly different. And we know it may even go higher based upon the potential deficits going forward. So in my, in my view, you know, supply from the Treasury is a factor in addition to what the Fed might do in, in terms of a mild bearish tone for um, U.S. Uh, U.S. bonds, U.S. Treasury bonds. I would expect the 10-year, for instance, now at, uh, what, 295, um, to basically uh, meander around 280 to perhaps 310 or 315 for the balance of the year, but not uh, not much of a change. It's, just, it's a hibernating bear market, uh, which means that the bear is awake but not really growling. Bill Ross there. Cambridge Analytica, the political consulting firm best known for working on President Donald Trump's campaign, uh, said it would cease operations immediately. In a statement released last evening, Cambridge Analytica has said that it has filed applications for insolvency in the UK in the fallout of the Facebook data scandal. Cambridge Analytica has been losing a lot of clients. Caroline Hyde of Bloomberg News has this report. It says due to the siege of media focus, which I guess we're adding to right now, it drove away all of their customers, all their clients, but still they stand by the fact that they did nothing illegal. Remember, they were accused of improperly gathering data on some 87 million people, and they said, look, these were, we haven't done anything illegal. They have unwavering confidence, they say, in particular, on their employees that they ethic acted ethically and lawfully. And as you say, they say they're being vilified I mean, this is notable that they are therefore commencing insolvency, bankruptcy proceedings, not only in the UK and the US. They say they're going to stand by the obligations to their employees, um, including notice periods, severance terms, but it seems that they're just no longer viable. 
Following a bizarre conference call post uh, earnings of Tesla, uh, the stock dropped more than 5% in after hours trading. The trigger was Elon Musk cutting off Wall Street analysts during the call, quite brutally I might add, dubbing the questions boring. Uh, however, Musk took several questions instead from a 25-year-old YouTuber uh, who is a retail investor in Tesla. Uh, here's a glance at some of the things that Tus, uh, uh, Musk said during those calls. We're going to go to YouTube. Sorry, these, these questions are so dry, <laughs> they're killing me. Uh, Bloomberg's uh, Dana Hall reports on what transpired on the conference call. Some analysts, including Tony Sakanagi from Bernstein and Joseph Speck, were kind of drilling into Elon about financials and, you know, when are you going to need to raise capital? You're saying that you don't need capital and, you know, talking about cash flow. And Elon was very testy and dismissive and said that the questions were boring. And then he went when he said, I, let's go to YouTube. There's a retail investor who had sort of agitated to get on the earnings call. And then he was allowed to ask several questions. I believe the transcript is out and he asked about 13 questions. And to be fair to him, <laughs> some of his questions were very good. But it was just unusual for analysts to be cut off by that and for a retail investor to basically get more calls on the more questions on the call than anybody else. He was clearly more interested in talking about the product roadmap, the Model Y, the Tesla semi truck. And I mean, that's that's what he really liked to talk about. And, uh, you know, it was he was very sort of dismissive of concerns about the balance sheet. And so I think you're seeing the shares decline a little bit because of that. Unusual behavior by Elon Musk. Chinese phone maker Xiaomi is now filing for an IPO in Hong Kong. It will be the largest IPO since Alibaba's $25 billion offering in 2014. Bloomberg's Peter Elson now joins us from Tokyo with more details on this one. Peter, thank you so much for joining in. Uh, what does Xiaomi want to do? How much does it want to raise? What are its ambitions? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. So what Xiaomi did today is it filed the paperwork for an IPO in Hong Kong. It did not specify how many shares it's going to sell or what its goal is for fundraising at this point. But according to the sources that we've talked to, they're looking to raise at least $10 billion, which, as you mentioned, would make it the largest uh, IPO since, since Alibaba went public. Uh, um, about five years ago. So that will be, uh, yeah, that's a big target for them. Uh, they did disclose lots of financial information. Uh, their growth is very, very uh, fast. Uh, in the past year, uh, they grew sales very rapidly. That, of course, is built on the smartphone sales, but what they emphasized uh, in the financial statements and also in their mission statement is they're, they're looking to sell the hardware, the phones and other kind of hardware products at very low profit margins and on top of that sell additional services, sell advertising to uh, corporate customers in order to make higher profits. So the idea is kind of these low margin hardware products, including smartphones that will be loaded with the latest technology and then selling services and other kinds of uh, goods on top of that. Peter Elson, many thanks for joining us. That's Peter Elson talking about Xiaomi's plans. It's IPO that the market is excited about. Uh, the 2018 Beijing Auto Show was focused on delivering the perfect amalgamation of luxury and comfort. The mean machines ranged from an electric Maybach crossover concept to a Mercedes a limited edition, a, uh, a limited edition, uh, it's a McLaren. Take a look at some of those beauties.
out of time on the show. Thank you for watching. Countdown is up next. The design of this logo began in Seattle in 1971 with three university friends who really liked coffee. They also really liked the Herman Melville novel, Moby Dick. So much so, they decided to name their company after Captain Ahab's ship. But branding exec Terry Heckler decided Pequod Coffee didn't sound quite right. So they went with the name of the first mate, Starbuck. Heckler then trawled through maritime books and found a 15th century woodcut of a two-tailed siren. Instead of luring sailors onto the rocks, this mythical mermaid would call people to come and grab a cup of coffee. Initially, her chest was bare, but after some complaints, Heckler redrew the design with long hair that covered her body. The logo also went from brown to green, a symbol of freshness and growth. In 2011, the Starbucks siren was redesigned with rounder details. A longer shadow was also introduced on the right side of her nose, a small element of asymmetry which made her feel more human. She can be spotted in 76 countries and markets, helping Starbucks to reach a brand value of more than $8.7 billion. Bold and alluring, this is the design that started with a myth and became a coffee legend. Sir, 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 please believe me, I am in this business for the last 12 years. Okay, I'll wait for your call. Thank you so much.